Thank you so much for coming. This is um, kind of a fun talk for me. It's a bit of a stream of consciousness of sort of what I have experienced over the last 15 years uh, since I started, um, no, actually probably 20 years. And um, I really enjoy giving it. It's meant to be a bit more of a conversation than a didactic thing. So if you have questions as I go along, just feel free to ask them. For the people who are online, I'm going to open up my box every once in a while to see if you have questions. So hopefully this works. And thanks for joining us as well. So yeah, so we have about an hour. Um, so feel free any point that you want to make comments or questions. And I recognize some of your faces as faculty, graduate students from the School of Nursing. Is there anybody here who's not from the School of Nursing? Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this, um, yeah, so I'll just get started and feel free again to just stop me at any moment. So the one thing I want to say is don't give up. The beginning is always the hardest. So I'm going to be talking today about sort of all the aspects of what we consider a research career. And I kind of talk about this around, um, a bit around the CD. And it's not meant to be I don't want it to come across as superficial because certainly all the work that I do in my research uh, program is very engaged with the people there. But what I have learned over the last 20 years is it's really important to keep track of what you're doing and think about what you're doing and spread out what you're doing and to be very conscious of the commitments that you make to different groups and individuals as you sort of start to develop the picture and the story of your research pathway in your career. So there are lots of different uh, research careers, and I just wanted to talk about this a little bit. I can't remember the statistics, but um, of the people who get their PhDs, I don't know, Wendy, if you know, very few actually end up in a tenure track position, depending on the discipline. <laughs> a lot of it. Okay. So in nursing, we might be unique. Yeah. So I just want to say that this there are a range of careers to go into after you do your PhD, and um, I've had the opportunity to have a few of these prior to coming to UBC, so um, just also think about that as well, that it's not always a straight line between finishing a graduate degree and going into an academic position. But having said that, it's important to think about what that in-between part is about and how you might uh, position that in terms of eventually wanting an academic career if that's your goal. So I've just listed a few. Obviously, academia is one of them. The other role that's coming more prevalent for nurses with PhDs now are career scientists and practice-based research roles. I think if you work in a supportive uh, organization that might support one of these roles, it's a great role to negotiate. And if you're currently in your PhD, to start having conversations with your employer. So we all know fiscal budgets go April to March. And if you think that this is something you're interested in, start having those conversations with leadership in your organization now. Don't wait. And a lot of this story is don't wait. Don't think that you wait till you get that piece of paper and then you start thinking about this. This is a lot of work that you need to be thinking about every moment as you go through your career. Um, there are jobs as consultants. I did a lot of consulting prior to and during my PhD, actually, which was very good, um, great experience and great connections with people across health authorities and in policy roles. And then there are policy roles, of course, within our governments at different levels. So just um, interested, when I talk about these different roles, are most of the people here interested in an academic pathway? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. This will influence what I say, so. Okay. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to talk about a bunch of different elements of building a research career. So some of these you may or may not have thought of. I think sometimes we get very focused on particular things and let others drop away. So participation in scholarly communities, awards and funding, research experiences, conference presentations, publications, and community engagement and knowledge, knowledge exchange. I'm going to talk about each of those within the context of my own career. So you can kind of think about, you know, where you're at in these different areas and where you might want to build in or focus over the next while. So for the people in the room, 
Are most of you who are students in PhD programs? Are there anybody who's in a master's program? Great, because you, you are really ahead of the game being here. <laughs> okay. Um, so participation in scholarly communities. Never kind of underestimate the value of being involved in your scholarly com communities. So what am I talking about when I talk about scholarly communities? Um, when I finished my BSN here, I was lucky enough to be part of a mentorship program, and my mentor said to me, you really should join the Gerontological Nurses Group of BC. And so I did, and I've been a member now of that group for almost 20 years. Um, oh, thanks, Chantel. The people online aren't seeing the slides. So I'll just let Mary Lee come and fiddle-faddle. So I joined the GNABC, and that is a provincial association that also has the concomitant national organization, the Canadian Gerontological Nurses Association. And when opportunities have come up within this GNABC, or sorry, the CGNA, to participate, I have grabbed those. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in the other slides, but right now, for the last several years, I've been president or chair, sorry, of the research committee. So I coordinate the annual research grant competition. I participate in reviews of those research grants, and I also participate in reviewing abstracts for a biennial conference. Other common kinds of scholarly communities that nurses in particular may be um, associated with are Sigma Theta Tau, which is our Honor Society of Nursing, and we have a chapter here at UBC. And I have received a small research grant several years ago through Sigma Theta Tau, which was wonderful. Um, and I'm also, because my background is in gerontology, a member of the Canadian Association on Gerontology. So some of the key things that can come, uh, Chantel, I think merely fiddle-faddled, so if there, could you let us know if you can see the slides now, please? Um, so really important networking and building scholarly connections. So in the randomness of life, you never know what will come out of these connections. So a great example of this is in my master's degree. Okay, great. Thanks, Karen. In my master's degree, I did my, MS, or my master's thesis looking at the experiences of ever single older women living in the community. And through a bunch of random events, I ended up going to the National Social Sciences and Humanities Conference and being part of a group of papers about singlehood among women in a very interdisciplinary group. So I think, you know, sometimes being connected through these different scholarly communities can connect you with potential scholarly partnerships that you weren't anticipating. So sometimes we are only fostering those relationships with the people we see in person, but there can be great opportunities to work on papers with a graduate student at the University of Saskatchewan who has a common interest and bringing those things together to do a presentation at a conference because they also have the opportunity to do that. So I think that's a really important piece to think about when you're going to conferences and how you're building those connections. And some of those relationships last for 20 years, at least, because some of them are still going for me. And again, I've already talked about committee roles, and this is really important because, you know, you can then put that on your CV, that you have had active participation through committee membership. So before I became chair of the research committee, I was a member of the research committee. And so I think there are great opportunities there. Being a reviewer is something I didn't really know about when I was doing my graduate education and what that those opportunities are. So being a reviewer is a, a huge value to you as an individual because you learn what it looks like to read other people's work. So you get a good sense of your own work because you're reading what other people are doing and you really develop an ability to assess other people's work, which is really key because being a reviewer is a huge aspect of being part of the research community. So I'm a reviewer for manuscripts and there's a range of journals and journals are always looking for good reviewers. So it's kind of funny because I'm a reviewer for the Journal of Family Nursing and Reviewers also go through stages in their career. So Janice Bell, who's the editor of the Journal of Family Nursing, recently sent me a paper to review, and she said, Jennifer, I had two very novice reviewers review this paper. Can you, I kind of saved you, can you as an experienced reviewer now review this manuscript? And I said, sure. So it's really interesting how you kind of move along even within these different areas and aspects of your career in terms of your expertise. 
Um, research grants and salary awards. So we have an internal nursing research grant competition and Marilee often has one of our graduate students sit on that committee. Fantastic opportunity to be able to learn what it's like to review research grants within the company of experienced reviewers because you usually sit on that committee with at least two or three faculty who have experience reviewing at the national level or international level. So a lot of what I will talk about as I talk through these things are we sort of have local opportunities, national opportunities, and international opportunities. And as a person who's building their career tra trajectory in this way, you really should be at the stage of looking at local opportunities, and if you've kind of got that down, then looking at what are the national opportunities or the international opportunities to be engaged as a reviewer. And then conference abstracts is another great opportunity. So the Canadian Association on Gerontology, for example, puts out a call for reviewers for abstracts. The Canadian Gerontological Nursing Association is always looking for reviewers. And um, those are great opportunities as well to be able to evaluate things. And then there are the awards that you can get through your scholarly communities. So as I've already talked about, the Gerontological Nursing Association has a small research grant that is only available to people who have been a member for at least two years. The Canadian Cardiovascular Nursing Association has a research grant. A lot of those specialty kind of organizations that we're part of have small research grants. So you always, no matter how small the project is that you're working on, want to be looking for peer review funding. Because when your research has been peer reviewed, it kind of gives it that extra little boost. And I can tell you from reviewing our research grant competition, some years we have 11 applicants, some years we have two. So if you're meeting that bar of sort of rigor and excellence and working with your supervisor around preparing those applications, if you're in a competition where the success rate is 50%, that's pretty good as opposed to a national type competition with CIHR where the success rate is maybe 12 to 14 percent. So, and when you're looking from a CIHR reviewer perspective at someone that you have already obtained small grants and are building that forward, you say, okay, well, I'll trust them now with the money from CIHR because they have gotten a series of small grants from these different organizations. They have been building up the size of their grants and they have been building up the size of the organizations and competitions through which they're getting those grants. So those scholarly communities, yes, they have an annual fee to join and you may think, what am I getting out of this? But you know, you get out as much as you get put in as is anything in life and there are huge opportunities for you to participate in them. So awards and funding is the next topic um, because I could go on about this all a lot. I'm just going to take off my watch and make sure that I'm not going to go over, pace myself. Awards and funding. Um, so again, this is from my CV, and you can see, um, as I've just talked about, sort of that trajectory of building that towards getting increasing, um, sort of getting in those more competitive national type competitions. So when you're looking at awards, there are bursaries, which are typically non-competitive and are awarded based on perhaps sometimes need or other uh, characteristics. And then there are fellowships and scholarships, which typically are competitive. And then there are non-monetary awards, which are also really wonderful awards to get, like, oh, hello, Suzanne, like um, our CRNBC awards. So you might get a provincial award as a practice lead or an education leader or a research leader or a leadership uh, individual. So thinking through those awards, and yes, one thing I have learned is awards are even quite strategic. So um, if there's a award that you think you qualify for and you would like to be nominated for, don't sit and wait for somebody to start the nomination process. Go to your group and say, I think that I qualify for this and would like to be nominated and which one of my friends would like to nominate me? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it, it would be wonderful if we all had a group of friends who said, and colleagues who said, you're the one, I'm going to nominate you for this. But sometimes they need a nudge. And that's okay. Because that's how oftentimes these things work. Um, not always, but sometimes. So you need to think about that. Don't sit and wait for somebody to nominate you for Gerontological Nurse of the World year. But 
It's not happening for me yet. Uh, okay, so just again on the awards. So you can see I started out in 1999 with my old age pensioners of BC bursary. $500. Fantastic. I was so glad that paid for my textbooks and part of my tuition that term. And it was a surprise because it was a bursary and I had no idea it was through SFU that I got it. Um, but you can see then, I got a couple of those, and then when I went to do my master's, I got a master, NHRDP Master of Science Fellowship, which NHRDP was a precursor to CIHR, so I got my master's fellowship. Then I, during that time period, still kept on applying, because believe me, you're never off the hamster wheel if you're on this journey. Got the Canadian Nurses Foundation Fellowship, which lots of people here apply for and are very successful at obtaining. Then when I went to CIHR and applied there for a doctoral fellowship, I had a great supervisor. So supervisor is really key. Joan Anderson, you know, if a reviewer is reading that, they're thinking, yep, she, she's got a good supervisor. This one's going to get through. Um, I had my NHRDP master's fellowship. I had a couple of publications. So when reviewers are looking at you for fellowships, they're looking at whether or not you're worth the investment. Are you going to be successful? Are you have, do you have any output? Do you have potential for output? Do you have a supervisor who has a good track record of getting graduate students completed and through their degrees and into tenure track positions? So, and I don't mean to overwhelm people by saying all this, but this is how the system works. So it's, it's better, I think, to have this information and realize because you need to be strategic about things like thinking about conference presentations, thinking about publications and thinking about the kinds of ways you're building your funding history. Last year I had the good fortune, and again this is where being a reviewer comes in really handy, of sitting on the UBC Masters Tri-Council Adjudication Committee. Um, and I was blown away. So when I finished my BSN and was applying for my Masters, it was very unusual for anyone to have a public peer review publication. Very unusual. When I read those applications last year, every single applicant had at least one minimum going into the master's program. In nursing, we don't have a culture of publishing during our undergraduate time because we don't have an honors degree type program. So we can make ourselves competitive in other ways, but if you are in a master's program, you have an obligation to your participants, to your supervisor, and to yourself to publish your thesis or master major paper. Because you are not competitive if you do not have publications by the time you go up for a doctoral fellowship, in my opinion. So Wendy, you can always argue with me because you're in the room. But, but, but you know what? If you come, like, and your supervisor, anyways, your supervisor can tell you these things just looking at your CV. So this should already, you should already kind of be on this trajectory. And if you're not, it doesn't mean you can't get there. But it means that you're going to have to think about where you're spending your time. And that's the end of my talk, so I'm not going to go there yet. Okay, but you can see that was my funding kind of trajectory. And then now I hold a um, eight-year Health Scholar Award from Michael Smith Foundation. I wasn't successful at CIHR at the New Investigator Awards. Don't think, oh, Jennifer, you're successful at everything. Boo-hoo-hoo, tell us your story. I can tell you I have my drawers full of rejections. And you learn from each one, and you build on each one. But it helped a lot to have all this when I did apply for a Career Scholar Award, and I got it, and I'm very, very grateful for it. So that sort of, you know, when you're thinking about it, no amount is too small ever, even though sometimes the smallest amount is the most work, as I have just recently learned. <laughs> but it's good practice for the big, big ones, right? Okay, so funding research grant programs. If you're doing a thesis or dissertation, get yourself some funding. It's out there. Find it. Apply for an internal School of Nursing research grant. Um, some of you work in the health authorities where they have point of care research challenges. We have one of our current PhD students who for her master's thesis got really lovely funding from the VGH Nurses Foundation when I used to work there. Um, so you actually have, if you're a nurse and you're working with the health authorities, have access to a pretty awesome peer review research grant competition 
And I have sat on many of those review committees, and I could tell you, you'd be competitive. So apply for it. It's three to five thousand dollars, and then you have received peer review funding. There's also um, things around competitive versus non-competitive. So because we're very competitive in the research world, everything is better if it's what's competitive. So we always have to say if what we got was competitive or not competitive. I'm not saying non-competitive is not good, because non-competitive can make you competitive for competitive funding. <laughs> so never turn away any money. But think about how you're using it and thinking about how you're building towards becoming competitive. Make sure you're getting conference presentations and research outputs and publications from that. Because it, it's all looked at as a big package when you're going out for different jobs, roles, things you want to do. Um, so there's competitive versus non-competitive, and then there is peer review. So peer review is really considered the gold standard across all of these areas because it means that you've gone through, it should mean, that you have gone through a very rigorous process. It's not because I'm Jennifer that I got this. It is because people who were blinded to my identity, perhaps, or not, have gone through and evaluated my work and said that I, you know, rank the highest for the funding or high enough to get funding. I'm not saying peer review is a perfect process. Having sat in the CIHR operating grant committee, um, but it is the best that we have. And so, you know, we can make ourselves competitive within that peer review process. Any questions about awards and funding? Okay. And anytime people online want to ask a question, please just type one in because I think it comes up right away for me. Okay. So the next piece is about research experiences. And I talk about research experiences very broadly because there is a range of research experiences and you need to think about how you are involving yourself in research experiences. So we have sort of the most obvious ones, which might be a thesis or a dissertation. I don't have SPAR on here or major papers, but certainly they fit within those research experiences in a particular way. Um, but your thesis and dissertation. Now, when I think about being in a graduate program, the purpose of a thesis and a dissertation is not necessarily to solve the core issues of your substantive area. It is your research training. It is your training ground. It is the tools that you have for your toolkit as you move forward in your research career. So when I did my master's thesis, Helene Berman was my master's thesis supervisor at Western University, and um, she doesn't do anything in aging. And she was like, Jennifer, I have no idea why you want me to be your supervisor. And I'm not sure I want to be because I have nothing to do with your topic. And I said, you know, I want you to train me. You do critical feminist research. That is qualitative. That's what I want to learn about how to do. So I want you to be my supervisor. Carol McWilliam was on my committee, and she had the substantive expertise in my area. So you have to think about what is the research training that you want to get to get you out of your degrees to be an independent researcher. Because when you look at CIHR's language around how they fund people who are in um, positions like a clinical scientist or a tenure track position, they're looking for independent researchers. So if my entire focus was on finding out, you know, how single women were accessing transportation and housing and food and how they were thinking about that in their future. While that was a great substantive topic, um, that's not going to make my career but because I need that those tools in my toolkit that are very amenable to different topics. And so today I find myself doing qualitative research across a huge range of topics and I will get to that in a bit. Um, but it starts with that research training. And so when I started my PhD here, Joy Johnson called me. She was the PhD program coordinator at that time. And she said, hi, Jennifer, blah, blah, blah. And she says, um, we're assigning you to Joan Anderson. I said, please don't do that. I said, why don't I? I said, I heard she's really scary. <laughs> and she said, well, we think you're up to it. And I said, but she doesn't do aging research, and I do aging research. She's like, yeah, we think you could do it. We think you'll get through with Joan. And what I got from Joan was a big, huge suitcase of research training that is priceless. 
um, and likely saved me from doing post-op because I did a lot um, to take around with me. And so, and Joan was fabulous at, in my substantive area too, but, you know, she prepared me in a research training way. So I'm going to say this as politely as I can because nurses often come into graduate degrees and do their research portion off the side of their desk while they're working full time. I'm not a fan of that model, but I get why that happens. But you need to be thinking about what you're putting in your toolkit if you think you're going to have a research career. If you're having an advanced practice career, that's a different pathway that I'm not talking about today. But if you're in a research trajectory, you need to think about what's going in that suitcase. Research assistantships. So that brings me to this. So these are really important. They pay like $15 to $25 an hour. <laughs> but I can stand here and say I have received research training from Heather Lashinger, Cheryl Forchak, Marilyn Ford Gilbo, Helene Berman, Joan Anderson, and I think that's almost it. But I worked a lot as a research assistant because I wanted to have a research career and I want to be able to talk about the people who trained me and I wanted to network with them and have them get to know me and have them get to help me. So these are really valuable roles and it may not put a lot in your bank account in comparison to what it would if you're working a shift as a registered nurse, but the payoff in other ways is huge. So when I was doing my PhD, when I started my PhD as a master's prepared gerontological nurse, I worked casual because I got a lot of bang for my buck doing a 12-hour shift, and I worked 12 hours a week for Joan as a research assistant. So you have to always be thinking about the now, but where are you going? And what can you put in that section about research on your CV at the end of the day? So research assistants, I'm a huge fan. Postdoctoral fellowships, this is a really important piece for some people. Um, you can build further relationships with new supervisors and employers, expand that toolkit. So I work a lot with Carol Esterbricks out of U of A, who has this huge program of research and knowledge translation. She has tons of postdoc opportunities. So some people will get to the end of their PhD and say, you know what, I want more for my toolkit, and they'll go work with someone else. And then a potential employer is saying, wow, they've now gone and done a year or two with someone like Carol. Um, and also the postdoc fellowships can provide opportunities for further opportunities for presentations and publications, which is another really important part of your story as somebody who wants to have a research career and can give you time to work on those things as opposed to when you go directly into a position where you might be doing teaching and service work in addition to your research. And then there's research at work. So when I finished my PhD, I worked at Vancouver Coastal Health as um, in professional practice, and this really opened up my eyes to things about ownership of data and negotiation of research relationships. So when you are working in that kind of environment and doing research, it's really important up front to have clear conversations, perhaps even in a contract or some written agreement about, you know, can you publish this? Because research that's done within the health authorities is not always amenable to being published publicly for a variety of reasons. Um, who is the author of this work and whose name at the end of the day is going to go on publications or research? Because it can be really surprising when a colleague comes up to you and says, hey, hello, I was part of that. And you're like, really? Did you grind that wheat? No. Um, and when you are working here at the university, it's a little bit easier to look at them and say, sorry, you weren't out in the field with me. When you're working in a politically charged healthcare environment, like anywhere, um, it's really important to have these conversations up front. And this is what was my big takeaway when I worked there. And research ethics. So all of the health authorities in this work started a long time ago what is the difference between a QI project and a research project? When do you need to get research ethics? You know, and all of those things, you need to think about that before you start. Because there are great projects that you can do at work that can feed into your research experiences, but you need to have the parameters of those really agreed upon up front. 
because otherwise, let me tell you, it gets really messy. And as Elaine knows, years later, you can end up with absolutely nothing to show. <laughs> but they're all good experiences. And sometimes you just take life lessons away, and that's about it. Okay. Any questions about research experiences? Oh, I have a question. How do I know? So I just open this up. How do you go looking for a research position? Oh, Allison. How do you go about looking for a research and practice position with a health authority? That's a great question. I think there are many models, and someone like Angela Wolf can speak better to this than I can. Oftentimes, um, I mean, it depends on your role. Not all the roles are amenable to having a research component. So then we have people like Sandra Lauk, who is, and Martha Mackay, who have roles of clinical scientists. Um, and they have a particular chunk of their role carved off for research, um, but not all roles do. So it's really something you negotiate with your supervisor if you want to have a piece dedicated to research. And, you know, a lot of times the answer will be, well, that's not part of your role. And then you have to make a decision whether or not you're going to stay in that position. If you're a clinical nurse specialist, you probably more likely work in a position where you could go to your supervisor and say, as a clinical nurse specialist, a portion of my role needs to be dedicated towards research. And this is my justification for that. Having said that, I work, um, have done tons of work with Maureen Shaw, who recently retired from VGH as a clinical nurse specialist for gerontology. And in our partnership, she often would generate the idea and come to me and say, Jennifer, I think this is a great idea for a research project. And I would say, you're right, Maureen, it is. And I have the research tools to work on that, and she has the tools to facilitate access to the site, to ensure the research is completed in a timely and successful manner, and we worked our partnership out that way. So I think there's a huge range of ways to have research be part of your role when you work in the health authority. And I actually just talked to Marilee this morning about doing a toolkit session about that with Sandra, about our experiences. But I think it is much more, at this point in time, a one-off kind of a thing, or an individualized piece, I guess I'd say, as opposed to something that cuts across nursing roles in a more kind of consistent way. I might have just cut everybody off. I hope that answers your question a bit, Allison. I'm always happy to... Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, conference presentations. Okay, where to present. Be strategic. Don't waste your time. If you take something else away from this talk is be strategic about how you use your time. So think about, you know, where you're going, why you're going, who the audience is, and, you know, what the purpose is that you want to get out of and give to the audience that is there. Because we have a big range of conferences that we can go to. And it's interesting because in the common CV for all, almost all of our research funding agencies, they now ask you who is the audience. Because they want to know that you're not just going to every conference to talk to academic researchers. They want to know that there's a range of knowledge users that you're translating your research findings to and with. So the type of conference, you can have practice-based, research-focused, and again, really considering the audience. There's the size of the conference. So this is where we would have sort of the local conferences. So for me, we have an annual um, provincial conference for the Gerontological Nurses Association of BC. There's national conferences like the Canadian Association on Gerontology. Then there are international conferences like the World Congress on Gerontology. So thinking about, you know, where are you presenting? What is your message? Um, and those kinds of things. So I said location, location, location. People also like to see you sometimes going somewhere different to present. So I am well known for presenting here in Vancouver because of personal ties here. But there are people who, you know, go all over the world to spread their message. The thing you want to be really careful about if you do that, and I think John Olaf once called it the Travelers and Tourists Pass, uh, and you have, this is again, the whole balance of what you do. Yes, you can go to Italy, Vietnam, and Australia to present a paper, 
fabulous. I'm sure I've never been off the continent. But every one of those presentations should be transferring into a publication. So if your CV looks like you are a fabulous traveler who has presented all over, and then you get to the publication section and it's empty, then you are not really helping yourself. So one of the things that, um, you know, if you really want to draw the straight line is get a research grant, do presentations. You're probably doing five to seven presentations at different levels of sort of the local, in, national, international level. And then you have one or two publications. And if you are sitting there having fabulous presentations internationally that you haven't translated into publications, then you need to sit your butt in Vancouver for the next 12 weeks or however long it takes you to produce a manuscript to get it done and get it finished. Because you won't help yourself by going to Florida, to Disney World for the next conference that is there. Okay? What to present, poster versus paper. So there are different types of presentations. Some people like posters, some people like papers. Uh, posters are generally for things that are very much in the beginning stages where you don't have your findings yet or for smaller projects, but I would really encourage people to be presenting papers because different disciplines have different norms. Yes? Um, I have a question about presenting So what is it? Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with presenting internationally. I think it's actually really, really important, but you need to have the publication to go with it eventually. Yeah. Because there are people that, you think Wendy? Yeah, Wendy's nodding. I'm happy. I'm always looking at Wendy for the nods. So, yeah, and so definitely I'm not saying don't, one of my things on my to-do list is that I must present at an international conference not in Vancouver once a year, or at least try to. That's my goal because of sort of where all of my balls in the air are. Um, but if you're presenting a lot internationally, that's fantastic, but make sure you have the publication eventually to go with it. Because if you have 10 years worth of international publications and you've been everywhere and seen everything and can count that many countries off your list, but you don't have the publications, then people are going to be like, they travel a lot internationally to present. Silence. Okay. So the poster versus paper. So some disciplines are all about posters, I hear. In nursing, we are not so much. So posters are good, um, as I've already said. Um, but the papers, I think you got to get in front of a group and talk. And if you don't like public speaking, get over yourself and get it done. It is not that bad. We all have things we don't like to do. Practice. And the other thing is about all this, like, Practice in front of a group of colleagues. Invite everybody to say, hey, I'm going off to this international conference. I'm really excited, and I'd like to go through my presentation with you before I go. Come to room 206. I've booked it, and give me feedback. Give me raw feedback. Let's invite Jennifer. And then, you, you know, you kind of have to get, it, get through that. Okay, and there are also new and emerging types of presentations, which can be like lightning talks, these really short things where you have one minute and two words you can say are great ideas. So put yourself out there and do some of those really fun things. I think it's great. Okay, so that's my conference presentations. Publications. I'm going to start talking faster. So building your publication record is really, really important. So I was very, very fortunate and had the unbelievable good fortune to do my undergraduate degree here, have a fabulous mentor named Clarissa Green who got another student and I to publish a paper based on a paper in uh, her advanced family nursing class. So I caught that publication bug really, really early. But it is really, really key um, because this is a huge way that we disseminate our research. So transforming student papers into publishable manuscripts, you know, I have gotten reviews back long time ago that said, this looks like a student paper that you just submitted for publication. And I was like, how did they know that? <laughs> well, 
now that I'm a reviewer, I really get how we know that. <laughs> so when you get a paper back from a faculty member and it says, this would be a great publishable paper, that does not mean go upload it to the journal. <laughs> That is an invitation from that faculty member for you to set up a meeting with them and say, you said that you think this might be publishable. What might that look like? And would you like to be a co-author on that paper? Because by the time that professor has marked that paper, they have poured some of their intellectual content into your paper. So my other message in this section is, recently there's stuff about honor co-authorship. Don't, I think that authorship needs to be a generous act. We are now sort of in a paradigm. It used to be it was great to publish by yourself. Now people look at publications where you publish entirely by yourself and they say, doesn't anyone like them? <laughs> Don't they have anybody else's thoughts that they want to integrate into this idea? So we now have swung the other way to putting everybody's name on things. I think you can sit somewhere in the middle, but don't underestimate what I have learned in my long view back of 20 years. Don't underestimate the contributions people are making along the way. So you go to the professor and you say, like, what would that look like? And then you pick a journal that would be an appropriate home for your paper and you have to revise it and it's going to be hard work and it's going to feel like it's horrible and brutal and wonderful all at the same time because it will get done. But a paper never goes from, I wrote a paper in class, it's going to be published in the high impact journal. It does not happen. Show me a paper that that has happened with. So you need to go through that because lots of our graduate students have published papers that they wrote for um, assignments. And if you're sitting and you're in a PhD program and you do not have a publication yet on your CV, and I'm not looking at anyone in particular, I have no idea what is on anybody's CV in this room, if you're sitting in that position, you have never had a publication, and you are sitting in this talk because you think you're going to have a research career, you need to figure out what you can publish and spend some time during your break between terms working on that. Because by the time you finish your, when you finish your PhD is not the time to start thinking about what could I publish. There are great literature reviews to publish. Okay. So peer review happens before and after the manuscript submission. I yes, sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering, so finishing a PhD, is there like a magic number of publications you're grading for? Like it's like three or like is there like what are we doing? I think you <laughs> I think you aim for one okay. and then you start working on the next one. Okay. If there's no magic number, but the magic number is definitely not less than one. Okay. <laughs> Because you could have like seven papers in development. Um, even if I have seven papers in development, I never put seven papers on that part of my CV. I'd be like three or four, so I look focused. <laughs> I could have 50 papers I'm working on. So yeah, work on the first one because each one is brutal. Each one is like probably doing, what is that race called? The mutter up at Whistler. <laughs> Tough mutter. Every publication is a tough mutter. So it's easy to sit and think, I could have six publications by the end of this year or by the end of this degree. That'd be awesome. I have those thoughts all the time while I'm taking a break. <laughs> but it doesn't get one of them done. So just get that one done. That my, my, would be my main advice. Just like I can't read more than one book at a time, I don't write more than one paper, really, at a time. Okay, so peer review always happens before and after. So you have friends, you have colleagues, whatever you call them. I have never recently submitted a paper. I don't know that I ever have, where I didn't give it to somebody and say, let me know what you think. That doesn't mean you're going to be a co-author on my paper, and sometimes you have to have that conversation if it's somebody who's clearly not going to be co-author to say, I'm not asking you to be a co-author, but I'd like your feedback on this paper. And that person might say, well, I don't give feedback on papers that I'm not a co-author on. Thank you. So again, this is about figuring out who you are, because I'm not going to read a zillion papers that I am not a co-author on. This is Jennifer. But I, do it, I would do it for particular people, because you have collegial relationships. Anyways, I'm sure you can all figure that part out. 
But what I'm saying is never submit a paper unless it's being read by somebody else because you're missing all the typos, the grammatical mistakes, the misaligned references. And sometimes you're just missing a whole big thought idea that you think is in there, but is not. So it's really important to get feedback. So that's why it is good to have co-authors, because sometimes your co-author group is that group of people that provide that level of feedback. Because then it goes to peer review. And let me tell you, that's the part where you're digging down in the dirt. It's muddy. There's a barbed wire over your head. And, you know, they come back and tell you how be much better you could have done the study or the paper. Yes. I think sending it to a professional editor is great, if, and you have to know what your strengths are as a writer. So I don't personally use a professional editor because a professional editor is not going to help your substantive paper. Um, they might mask it, but I could tell you, it, I have read lots of papers that have been professionally edited that are rejected. So personally, I never invest in a professional editor until I kind of get to the point, perhaps, on a third resubmission where they've been like, you really need to get a professional editor. And then I'm like, okay, I have this professionally edited. But it's not worth the investment otherwise. Because you should have good writing in graduate school. Hopefully your writing skills are such that you're ready to write a paper for publication. And it's expensive to use an editor. Co-authorship, I've talked about that already. So your journal, whichever journal you're submitting to, will have guidelines around that. Impact factors, while there's lots of questions about impact factors, whether or not they're real, fake, whatever, they're still important, so check out the impact factor. The impact factor means how many times papers within that journal get published or get referenced. And we now have individualized impact factors, and there's lots of people calculating our impact out there. So I always aim high. I always have a list of two or three uh, journals that I'm going to send something to, and I start with the high one. And if it gets rejected, I always do what the reviewers have told me to do to the extent that they actually apply. And then I resubmit it somewhere else. Oh, was there? Thank you. Was there a question? Oh, there was. Um, how do I find the question? Oh, here. Allison. Are your doctoral supervisors assumed to be co-authors on any papers? Yes! <laughs> okay. We have a policy here at the School of Nursing. Trust me, you feel like you're doing your dissertation alone, you're not. As someone who has had lots of time to think about this. Because they helped you get your proposal done, they did the research ethics. Believe me, those people feel like they have dragged you across a field, <laughs> like a plow horse. And it's not always like that. And it doesn't feel that way to you because you feel like you have been alone in the desert or the forest where it's snowing by yourself in a blizzard, in the snow and the sand. And we have had no contact and we're not responding to you and all those things. And we feel like the plow horse. So, yes, your dissertation supervisor is most definitely to be offered co-authorship. They may say to you, and most of us are mature enough to say, when we don't need to be a co-author. Take your supervisor wisely. Yes, Tracy? So I have a question about impact factors. So yeah. Your thoughts. So many journals don't even have impact factors because of where they're positioned in terms of who their audience is and who they're trying to access. So an author might choose a non-impact factor journal because they're trying to reach a particular audience. And you know, is that a part of the consideration um, when someone's looking at what is your so I would say Tracy's asked a great question about impact factor because we do have journals that don't have impact factors. You need to be careful that you're not getting sucked into what are those journals called that are just predatory. predatory. Don't get sucked into the predatory journals. But then there are other journals that um, will allow you, like the Canadian Nurse, for example. Or the Canadian, uh, or, uh, yeah. Canadian Oncology Nursing Journal. Very specifically yes. targets practicing oncology nurses, and they read that journal and want to ask them. And I had a paper, actually, that reminds me last year, published in the Family Physician. All the Canadian Family Physicians, because I wanted that message to get to that group. You don't want all your articles to go to that journal. So, again, you're strategic. So, you might have one journal article that's very um, academically focused on your research findings, and you may have one that goes to a very practice-focused group. You don't want all 
So like you want to balance. Like if you're at the very beginning, I'd say if this is your first journal article, you need to go somewhere with an impact factor. If this is your career pathway. But then as you go on, you think about knowledge translation and exchange and transformation and transformative approaches. Because then you can, in your story of yourself, explain, Jennifer, why did you publish in The Family Physician? Well, gee, because I want to have at least thought that every family physician in Canada had access to an article about using plain language with people with intellectual disabilities. Because for my participants, for my orientation in my research, that's really important. But I also have a paper in The Gerontologist, which is the highest ranked gerontology journal about families aging with a family member with intellectual disabilities. So it can't be one or the other. Does that help? Okay. So those are, and then we have open access, which typically is a fee of two to five thousand dollars, which would be out of reach for most people. Um, which is another, but it's another piece that's coming up around knowledge translation and exchange. And many, many years ago, I went to a great manuscript writing at lunchtime talk with Joan Batorf, and she said, every paper has a home. And that is true. So don't give up on your paper. It can get, the best papers sometimes are the ones that are, like, I just had one accepted. Oh, my finger came out. I just had a paper accepted, and it was just like pulling some teeth. But I love that paper, and it's a paper that needs to get out. And sometimes it's like a topic will rub people in particularly a bad way, and you just have to go. But every once in a while, if you're getting a paper that's being rejected a lot, you should also go to your colleague slash friend and say, like, is there something about this paper that, like, because if the research methods are weak, yeah, you're not getting published. But if it is just they don't agree with your topic or don't want to publish your topic, but it's a good paper, then keep going. Every paper has a home. I'm almost done. This is just stuff matter. Yes? Um, I have a question about publicity. If we have, say, maybe your master's work, you're looking back now and say, hmm, I could have gotten a paper out of that. How long is it before it's too cold to go back to it? That's tough because it's hard to leave anything because when you think about it, like the time from when you submit, like I would say the paper I just got submit, got accepted, has been in review for a year. So the, pa the research was actually finished a year before that because it's qualitative, so I need to do my analysis. And now it will sit in early view for a year or so. So it's already getting pretty chilly and cold at three years by the time it ever hits. So I think, you know, if it's five, and most, a lot of journals actually have rules that say if this data is more than five years old, we will not publish it. But that doesn't mean ideas from that time aren't publishable. So there are great discussion papers or literature reviews or pieces that you may be able, but sometimes you just need to cut that loss and think about what am I doing now that's fresh. Because one of the other things I realized from all the work I've done, the ideas of 20 years ago, I mean, it's really funny. The first paper I published was about family policy. What kind of work do I do now? Family policy. So. It's, it's still influencing your thinking and your writing. I would say that. Okay, the last thing I just want to talk briefly about is community engagement and knowledge exchange. Um, I just want to tell this story quickly because this is a story of kind of unexpected outcomes from partnerships. So in everything that you take on, you've only got so much time and energy and you need to think about where to put your time. So many years ago now, I was invited to be on one of the point of care research challenge things uh, with nurses from St. Paul's Heart Center, long-term care nurse I am. I would never have ever in my life that I have never gone to the Heart Center. Um, but I did qualitative work, so they said, you know, this other person has pulled out of our project. Would you be willing to mentor us? And I said, sure. It was early in my time here. I didn't have a lot on my plate. So I said, sure, you know, you never know ever what comes from the seeds that are planted. So Leslie, who is the clinic nurse for the trans catheter A or valve implantation clinic, put in this point of care research challenge. And I started to work with Sandra and this whole group there and realized their patients are all really, really old. And so they are, in fact, doing research that relates to my work. And since we started our partnership, we have gotten two CIHR grants many conference presentations, because all of us go out and do the conference presentations. 
So the other thing to realize as you kind of grow your network, you're not necessarily the one going to Japan. I'm never going to Japan, but Sandra might go to Japan and present a paper that I'm on, and that's awesome. And so your network grows and your outputs kind of grow accordingly. And actually this paper was just published um, in the European Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing. And this is also speaks to what people need and want to get out of things. So what do I need and want to get out of things? Well, I sit here, so I need to get publications. Sandra is a new investigator. She needs to get publications. Leslie, yes, it's nice to get a publication, but that's not where she is in her career and not her top priority. So she was the PI on the project, but she then, you know, in terms of writing the paper at the end, she's like, yeah, you guys go do that. You need that. So having those kinds of really open conversations within a trusted network about what do I need right now? How can you help me? These partnerships, you know, this is now year five or six that we're working together. So I think, you know, you have to be thinking about what, what you need, what they need. And this is research now that's getting translated into policy and practice, which is also really exciting. But the last thing I just wanted to say was that this is a juggling act. So don't think you're going to spend all your time on one aspect of that. This, you need to think about um, what do you need to work on right now. So I really recommend developing a personal support network. When I was in my graduate school, my personal support network were the other students because they were the only people who understood the madness of trying to work as a nurse, having your home life, and all of this. That was a huge support. They're not people I do research with, but they are a huge part of my support network. Keep track of activities because you never know what it was that was important and you didn't keep track of it and then you lose it and you forget about it. So keep track. Keep a little list. Very important. Never, ever, ever embellish or exaggerate anything that you do. If you wrote your president's message in your local newsletter, that is not a publication. And so if you wonder, ask your doctoral supervisor to review your CV or your master's supervisor or a colleague, but maybe a colleague wouldn't be quite as honest as you. Anyways, never embellish or exaggerate because it is really, really, really obvious when you do to people who are reading these things. Um, and remembering which fall is most important at a particular point in time. So getting good grades is really important. So don't sacrifice your coursework to get a publication done. That is not the takeaway message today. But be thinking about your publications so that when you're not in the course, you can be finessing it. So always be thinking about it um, and who those professional networks are, where you're presenting your work, how you're presenting your work, research networks you're building, reviewing opportunities you might have. These are all things that you should sort of be thinking about and then prioritizing them as you go along. And if there are things that you are currently doing that are not supporting where you want to get to, you need to let them go. So you need to edit your activities. So I encourage you to be thoughtful about that um, because I recently went through someone who I work with, and I was just like, eh, 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 because I know where they want to get to, and I know that those three or four things are not going to support them to get there. So, you know, if you need coaching or mentorship around that, seek that out, because there is a finite amount of time, so think about what you want to get done for where you want to go. Okay, that is all I have to say. Are there any questions, lingering questions online? So I think our time is done. Sorry? Of course. I could stay here all day and talk about this, but I know other people have to go. It's one of my favorite topics. Being strategic about your CV. So if somebody's not necessarily connected to the health authority, but they see themselves potentially wanting to make inroads, I would ask for an informational interview with a leader at that health authority. So when I was in 
finishing up my PhD, the professional practice at VGH or Vancouver Coastal had had a position posted for director of research and clinical systems transformation, blah, 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 posted for a long time and then it went down. And um, so when I was getting ready to look for a job, I contacted Amy McCutcheon, who was a CNO at that time, and I said, hey, is that job still available? This is what I'm interested in. I think um, I don't want to throw names out, but I mean, David Byers has always been welcoming of talking to people about these types of career pathways. I think um, one of the things I did learn in the, I shouldn't say this is being recorded, uh, never, never, um, always feel okay to reach out to someone who is in one of those leadership positions. If they don't have time to talk to you, they will say, I don't have time to talk to you. But if you say you would like an informational interview or a time or have coffee with them to talk about the potential opportunities within that organization, in my experience, they're usually more than happy to do that. It doesn't mean you're going to get a job tomorrow. But also, I did tons of consulting work through those relationships that I built by being a research assistant with Joan Anderson. And that paved my way for, you know, five years. So, so I think it is reaching out because those kinds of opportunities aren't necessarily up on the website, right? But you have to build those networks and relationships yourself. But it shouldn't be intimidating because people are just people. They're just waiting to hear from you. So I would encourage people to do that. I've never had a bad experience asking somebody to talk to me. Anything else? Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, online. I think we'll turn you off now. And, oh, I'm not allowed to touch it. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming over your lunch hour. Thank you. Okay, it won't touch it. Okay. Sorry.